Do you have a favorite five G conspiracy theory that you covered? I mean, the the uh, the one that sort of like stuck out in my head is that that. Um, and it's taken from a, 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 a largely disproven and discredited paper from 2001 uh, to do with uh, bacteria communicating using electromagnetic pulses throughout the body um, that, you know, that, that these viruses, COVID-19, can communicate with other infected hosts using um the, the 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 5G airwaves. I mean, it's just it just beggars belief that some of these idiots believe it. Um, I, I I you just don't even. There's no way to argue with them. Hello and welcome to another telecoms.com podcast. We've had a gap of about 10 days because of various things, but we're back and that's what matters. Um, we've got the usual crew from home. Jamie, is, is, have you actually got a, a picture in the back that didn't used to be there or are you just sitting at a different angle? There seems to be a bit more detail behind you than usual. Yeah, no, just sitting at a different angle around the table. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and Ian, you're uh, you're looking great, but a bit stubbly, mate. Is is this an yeah. indication of uh, you letting standards slip now that we're not having to little come bit. into the office? A little bit, yeah. Run out of shampoo and I haven't been bothered to buy any more. Doesn't seem like an essential in the same way that beer does. So, <laughs> well, and, and one other thing, one other thing that's starting to alarm me is is the haircut situation. I've got to be honest. It's starting to get yeah. a bit moody around the ears. I'm just not. I'm just not sure if I'm ready to go the full Davis with the clipping. <laughs> yeah, he would presumably advise it, but I, I don't know. I've, I've never done that in my life. I don't know if I'm ready. So uh, we'll have to see. Okay, uh, what are we going to chat about this week? So we're starting um, Q1 earnings season. So we're going to start by having a look at some of those, principally kit vendors, but I think there'd be one or two operators as well. Then we're going to move on to India, uh, primarily because Facebook has bought a stake in their biggest operator, but there's always the, the difficult time that the other incumbents are having for us to look at as well. And then we're going to conclude with a look at the ever-popular trending topic of Open RAN because um, new uh, m and in the States dish is getting involved with that. So we'll have a little chat about that. Okay, starting with the quarterly. So this week we had Huawei and Ericsson. Just trying to remember what I wrote about them. So I had a little chat. You presumably had a little chat as well, um, Ian. I had a little chat with um, Frederick Led yeah. Yedling. Yedling, name? I think. Yeah, yeah. Yedling. <laughs> um, and he sort of more or less echoed the uh, pre-prepared comments by Boya Ekholm, which was that things were sort of fairly solid. There were there weren't any big dramas to do with coronavirus. Um, their sales were a tiny bit down, adjusted for various bits and bobs, but nothing too scary. And perhaps more importantly, they, they hadn't downgraded their outlook. Um, so that, that, that sort of provided some reassurance to people who are wondering how hard hit the telecom sector has been. In fact, they specifically voiced some sentiments that they think the telecom sector has been sort of fairly robust on that. Was that was that the vibe you took from it, Ian? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, I was I was a little bit surprised actually. I thought they'd they'd um, be a bit more pessimistic than they were. I was a, I was a bit surprised that the guidance didn't get lower because I've I've written a few articles about them recently. So they're saying I think they look a bit you know exposed um, as a mobile only kind of kit vendor. Um, you need know, to talk to other people. They say a lot of spending sort of going into optical and and the fixed line side, and obviously people in countries under lockdown are more likely to rely on on Wi Fi and broadband. And er Ericsson's actually said that, so I did sort of think that they might adjust the guidance, but they have some fairly solid reasons for not doing that. One is China, and I, I know that the big kit vendors, the big Chinese ones, obviously got the the, the most of this um, China mobile G tender that was announced recently. But Ericsson was the only Western vendor that picked up a slice of that, and it got about eleven. 5% of the work, which is actually more than it's used to getting. And uh, Yedling was saying that's a huge job. You know, it's there's, there's ten, ten to thousands of base stations to be rolled out by that operator. They're still waiting for Telecom and Unicom, the two other operators, to announce uh, contracts. And they seem reasonably hopeful that they'll get some work there as well. So that's one reason. 
And then the other one's the US market, where it's a little bit more uncertain, I think, because the virus is obviously still, you know, still spreading there. It's kind of now turned into the worst country in terms of infections. And, you know, you hear talk about technicians not being able to go out to sell sites because of certain restrictions. But on the other hand, this this merger between T-Mobile and Sprint that had kind of held up a lot of investment activity last year has now is now gone ahead. So they're, they're kind of expecting that to, to trigger some spending. So... So even though there's there's a lot of concern about Europe, I think that's the big kind of slowdown area. You know, spectrum delay. They're kind of talking about projects being put off, but they're obviously hoping that these other big markets are gonna are gonna make up for that. And they look in a fit, pretty good shape at the moment. I mean, they've got loads of net cash. Um, their margins are looking a lot healthier than they have done in the past. So, yeah, it was it was pretty encouraging. I thought it was, and it was a lot better than I'd expected it to be. Yeah, and. Uh... They, I was I was sort of probing for some indication of whether um, operators were indicating that they were putting stuff on hold. Yedling, to be fair, kept his cars pretty close to his chest. Um, but, you know, he didn't seem to think – it's not like they've all been picking up the phone going, do you know what, you remember all those 5G chats we had? You can forget that shit for starters. Yeah. I don't think it's as simple as that. You know, I think maybe because of the, the sort of quite – capex intensive and long-term nature of the telecoms industry everyone's looking past even you know a couple of quarters of of severe slowdown in 2020 because they know they've got to build out the network they presumably already accounted for the capex so they're still yeah. more or less working on with it i guess well, i think go ahead I think sorry sort of hoping that the i mean i think they warned that the second quarter is going to be quite soft uh, and, and they're obviously still hoping, as we all are, that the second half of the year will be a lot better and that we'll see an easing of restrictions and maybe we'll even be over the worst of this. So who knows? I mean, they, they could they could revise stuff down later in the year if things if things get really nasty. But um, yeah, I mean, I, the same with me. I, I tried to get a sense of whether he thought CapEx was being shifted from from 5G, perhaps, or even 4G into into other areas. I mean, his main concern at the moment seemed to be on the supply side. When I was chatting to him, there was sort of, you know, if this goes on for a long time, they could run into constraints there. But the, the good news is they, I didn't know this, but apparently um, when this whole, you know, when, when geopolitics was the big topic of discussion and not coronavirus, they went through this phase of fairly heavy stockpiling, Ericsson. So they've, they've reckoned they've got enough components and enough, enough, enough sort of equipment to supply for the rest of the year. To avoid any kind of any kind of gumming up of supply chains that we might run into, so they're in a, they're in a pretty good position there. It's just if this really goes on a long time, then then it could be a worry further down the line. Okay, um, and one other thing, he, uh, one other sort of talking point he kept stressing to me, which is a, a fairly standard PRish sort of thing, was like they're determined to emerge from all this stuff in an even stronger competitive position how they went in which is fair enough i mean he's not going to go to be honest uh with, with all that's going on we can't really be asked at the moment we'll have to see how things turn out but you know he 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 repeated it often enough often out of context for me to realize that that was that was an important you know his his pr handlers were presumably holding up a big board in front of his face going say that um yeah. And uh, and that was, you know, that moves me on to the Huawei numbers. Um, the top line in terms of growth, they did a little bit better than Ericsson. They grew 1.4%. I don't know if that's adjusted for adjustments or whatever. Um, yeah. But so, so that seems on the top line pretty decent until you compare it to the whole, uh, to the annual growth of 2019, which was like, what was it, 19%, I think. Well, ninety percent, uh, but also thirty nine percent. I think in the first quarter of last year, so quite a bit right. compared with Q one twenty nineteen. Yeah, it's so mainly on that, I suspect is mainly on the devices side because that's that's the thing that kind of fell off a bit of a cliff in the second half of last year because of some of these restrictions that come in into force. Um, that's certainly what they've been complaining about mainly. Yeah. No, I think you're right. And so that's, as we always stress, when we're comparing sort of Huawei and, and its main networking competitors, you know, Huawei's not a public company, so it doesn't need to be particularly transparent in its numbers. This time, it, it really gave us a sort of token little dose of data. It pretty much talked top line revenues um, and top line margin, I think. Yeah, margin of 7.3%, but it didn't break it down by business group or anything by geography. 
anything like that. So we don't. There's not that much we can read into it. But I think you're probably right, um, Ian, in that the real drop off probably isn't so much on the networking side as on on the handset side, um, yeah. because you know over and above um, the pandemic and, and the general massive slowdown, there were all the other factors like the, the aggro with Google um, and and all that stuff that w- that were coming into play. So, um, yeah, that, that side of it's probably having a bit of a nightmare. Yeah, and, and the, I mean, the, the, the margin side of it was, was interesting as well. I noticed if you, if you worked it out, the net profit was down, was down a fair bit, actually, um, which I, I, I don't remember happening for a while, but um, maybe that's just me not sort of going over previous results carefully enough. But it certainly points to kind of the investment activity that, that, that's happening. They've, you know, they've made a big deal about this increase in, R and D spending, and you know, having to do a bit of stockpiling themselves, and um, you, you know, that that kind of showed up in the bottom line. So, to me, that was a kind of interesting aspect of the results as well. I think, I think the issue. I mean, you mentioned competitiveness there with with Ericsson trying to come out of this looking stronger. I mean, I think there is there's an opportunity there for Ericsson definitely because everybody's in the same position with coronavirus. It's not it's not like it gives one company a kind of advantage over anybody else if they're in the same market. And at the moment, we're seeing, we talk, I think we talked about this before, we're seeing a little bit of a backlash against China and, and Chinese companies. There's a bit of concern in Europe, I think. There's sort of, you know, EU officials running around saying, you know, government should take stakes in national companies to protect them from being taken over by China. There's a lot of negative publicity about China covering things up. And it doesn't leave the Chinese vendors in a particularly good position at the moment, I don't think, PR-wise. Sorry, sorry for the pause there. I tried to press the unmute button. It didn't do anything. Swine interface. Um, yes. Okay. Now we agree all that, and we've chatted about it before, and we doubtless will again. Um, you know, I feel, I feel popular sentiment, political and popular sentiment in the West, um, is is growing a bit more hostile to everything Chinese. I'm not, I'm not making any comment on whether or not I think that's justified. I'm just observing what yeah. appears to be the word on the street. Um, and and that's a and that's going to be a real challenge for them. And as you say, at the same time, Huawei's going, we're you know we're redoubling our. And it wasn't just them. God, there was there was someone else. I mean, there's been some acquisitions going on. I think maybe one of the maybe China Mobile or whatever was talking about increasing their investment in their own technology. I think oh that was it. Alibaba was talking about investing in its own chips and its own server infrastructure and all that sort of thing. So you're getting a general anecdotal stream of announcements coming from Chinese companies talking about being self-reliant. They, they couch it in the language of investment, of just broad investment. But there seems to be a real undertone of a desire for full supply chain autonomy, which is completely consistent with you know the, the feelings about balkanization. I mean the balkanization trend was underway anyway. I mean I wrote in the in the annual predictions piece that we do every year I give myself one at the end, and my chief predict my prediction was a, a greater balkanization, and that was just fueled by the rhetoric flying back and forth between Trump and Xi and all that sort of stuff. And of course, this coronavirus thing has, has massively accelerated that trend. Yeah, um, and I'm seeing more and more people. You remember, was it the last podcast, the one before I spoke about a sort of new Cold War? And Ian, you were all like, "All right, Scott, why not why not be a bit more cheerful?" Um, <laughs> But I'm seeing I'm seeing more and more articles of people talking about that, the economists talking in those terms, all that sort of thing. So that vibe's all growing, and you know, and referring it back to uh, telecoms, um, that is only going to provide make the the trading environment for Chinese um, operators uh, more difficult outside of of the Far East. In fact, before I ask Jamie to comment on. He's he's looked at one or two uh, operators and, and noticed a certain trend affecting their quarterlies. I might just mention that we just as basically as we started recording, we got ZTE's numbers in for the first quarter, and just having a look at their table, their operating revenue is down three percent year on year. Net profit, uh, net cash flow down seventy percent. Um. Uh, so, you know, I don't know, Ian, I don't know if you had a little think about these. I'm only just looking at them for the first time, but their yeah. down adjustment seems to be greater than others. 
Yeah, I, I haven't had a chance to look at it. I mean, they're they're also in the handset business as well, aren't they? So I, I don't, you know, again, it's it's difficult to sort of look at them. Um, just about, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's I suppose you've got to bear that in mind, though. It's not a complete like for like comparison with Ericsson. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's ZT seem to do quite a good job of bouncing back from all these problems they had a couple of years ago when they were on the US, you know, entity at first added to the entity list and. You know, they, they had heavy fines and they looked at one stage like they were going to go out of business and they've done quite a good job of coming back from that i think and you know they have been landing 5g contracts in some markets they're still getting used by operators that i'd expected to kind of not want anything to do with them anymore so um it's hard to it's hard to sort of yeah make an assessment of whether it's going to hurt them more badly than others i think at the moment but uh it doesn't doesn't look like the, the little that I saw. It doesn't look like they had a great first quarter anyway. Maybe they have taken a, a bigger punch than than either Ericsson or not or not Nokia Huawei. And Nokia's Nokia's the only one left, obviously. So it'd be interesting to see what they've got to say next week because they've they've had a, a bit of a tough time anyway in the mobile market recently with some product difficulties. But on the other hand, they they do have that kind of broad spread of of equipment. So they're, they're in some of these markets where you would maybe expect to see some spending going, like optical and and the core cool network. Maybe, maybe that helps them. I don't know, but we'll we'll find out next week on that side. Got one just while we're chatting about it. One possible theory why if if ZT's had a, a downward dip, one possible reason it, ZT is not the political football that Huawei is, um, and I think it's a matter of considerable face saving to the Chinese state that Huawei continues to do well. So maybe, and given that it's within the power of the Chinese state to more or less, this is my understanding, tell me if you, if, if you think this is wrong, to more or less dictate um, to the operators where they spend their money. Um, you know, maybe they had a little word with China Mobile, et cetera, and went, look, let's make sure Huawei gets enough business that we can go, ha, America, we're doing just fine without you, suck on that. And that could be to the detriment of ZTE, but that's just that's just me thinking out loud. I'm sure it's a bit more complicated than that. Well, they they did pick up quite a big share. I mean, Jamie might know the numbers better than I do, but I, I know Huawei got the biggest share of the China mobile contract that's been announced. But I think ZTE was the number two, um, you know, quite a bit ahead of, of of Ericsson, I think. So, so I think that they did reasonably well out of that deal. It's just that deal won't won't have made any difference in the first quarter. It it, it should show up later in the year. Yeah, that's a fair point. Okay, uh, Jamie, um, you spotted you wrote about uh, AT and T and Telia numbers, and you and you spotted a, a bit of a theme there. So why don't you tell us about that? Um, yeah, I mean it's nothing uh, too too dramatic to be perfectly honest. I mean this is uh, I'm tr I'm trying to cover the numbers uh, for the operators, but I'm I'm taking it with a massive pinch of salt because I I just don't think you can blame any company for reporting a downwards trend over the last four or five months. You know, uh, Tedia and uh, AT&T reported their numbers through to uh, March 31st, that was. So it was taking in, into account um, a lot of the, uh, the, the lockdown and uh, reversed uh, spending on enterprise, for instance, and, you know, more people uh, ditching premium TV contracts and going over to streaming. Um, I, I think it's... Overall revenues were down for both these parties, but it was the TV units that took the biggest the biggest hit. Mobility and the sort of like the wireless um, and wireline business units stayed reasonably steady. Um, but when you look for like for like sales in the TV businesses, they took a huge chunk out of um, uh, out of the financials. AT and T dropped lost like four hundred thousand subscriptions. Um, or something like that, like some, an absurdly high number, whereas uh, Telia was exactly the same. Um, it was the premium TV packages which really, really suffered for them. Um, it's just, I, I don't know, I, I think a lot of, a lot of telcos have, uh, have, have, have done well to, to position themselves in the TV space and they've made investments, but I don't think they've strategically aligned the business units um, internally, I think there's still too much reliance on TV and media as a standalone business, as opposed to integrating it with other connectiv connectivity offerings. If you look at Verizon, for instance, I think they've done a very good job with their Fios, um, with their Fios bundle. 
you can you can bundle it with mobile you can bundle it with tv you can bundle it with youtube tv and google stadia the cloud gaming proposition so they're integrating whereas a lot of these other telcos just seem to be using tv as a standalone revenue stream and i just don't think that's ever going to work yeah actually jamie we should get you to write another fios article because every time you do one of them we get a ton of reads for some reason <laughs> Uh, if you can hear my dog in the background, I will punt it as soon as this podcast is over, I promise you. Only joking, animal cruelty people who might report me to the police. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, and um, uh, they just launched uh, HBO Max this week as well, which seemed to sort of come with, with not much fanfare. But I, I, I do agree with you, Jamie. You, you can't just buy a pre-existing successful uh, video property and and bolt it on and think there'll be some kind of synergy. I think this, you know, this this is a problem with with M and A on the whole. Um, I certainly won't no, name any names, but uh, it, it's just a rich history of big companies going shopping. Going okay, there, we are. That's that's sort of accretive or whatever the M and A language and, and synergistic and M and A language like that. And then it turns out not only is it not synergistic, but then it's left a wither on the vine because it's being run by people. And I think if I might ask you in a sec, um, Ian, because you, you wrote a little bit about AT&T and its top management, but that was always our concern when they bought um, Time Warner uh, was that then they put telecoms people in front of, in charge of creative, creative unit. They start being all bean counterish about it. And they're going, do you really need a dragon in that? Because we can save a few bucks if we just put a hamster in instead um and then before you know it no one's watching it but um yeah ian what, what were you writing about was it sankey Is that just, just before we move on there just one one Wait, other, go ahead. Sorry, jamie just just to add to that i mean it, it, i i think i think not only is it it's been mismanaged i think they're 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 buying it for the wrong reason i mean when you look at the the the, the idea of a convergence business model is to have five or six different revenue streams driving into a single product offering and you save money um, through greater efficiencies and you make money through increasing ARPU uh, slightly. So this is where I think everyone is sort of like slightly mistaken what TV and entertainment is. It's not I'm buying this TV channel so I can make money off TV. It's I'm buying this TV channel so I can integrate it into um, into a, 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 a connectivity offering, um, which increases loyalty, ticks extra, extra boxes, adds value, and increases the amount that we can charge per month, whilst also streamlining our operations units. I think it's it, it, everyone's going for a silver bullet, whereas you need to layer and layer and layer convergence and gradually, gradually, gradually build like what Orange have done, really. They're the, they're the king of convergence, and they're the ones that everyone should really be looking to copy. Or you could just go for the buy something, sack half the people, and think that makes it more profitable approach. Which, uh, is that was that sort of the angle that you were looking at, Ian? Yeah, and I didn't look at the, I didn't look at the headline performance in different business areas so much. I just, I mean, I, I sort of looked at jobs a lot at telcos over the last couple of years, so... You know, one of the concerns, and there's been a lot of losses, a lot of job cuts in the US anyway, uh, even before COVID-19 came along. And obviously, one of the big concerns at the moment is unemployment, which is really high level now, I think, in the US. I think it's the 15% of the workforce. So it's, in, it's just interesting to see what happens on the telecom side. But AT&T had announced this quite aggressive $6 billion cost-cutting plan, I think, before um, before the virus you know, happened, before it, before it spread into the US. And they were getting asked about this, or you know, are you going to carry on with it, or what's the what's the plan now? And and Stanky's response was kind of, you know, we kind of see it as an opportunity to do more. Almost, I mean, it's and it's, it's pretty brutal because they've already, if you look at their, their numbers, I think if you include Time Warner at the end of twenty seventeen, they had about two hundred and eighty thousand employees. They're now they're now down to about two hundred and forty four thousand. So. Having cut thirty odd thousand to the start of the year, I noticed they'd they'd, lot, they'd cut another three thousand in the last three months, uh, up to the end of March. They've probably cut more in the last few weeks. They're, they're talking about one and a half billion savings on the on the staff side alone, which sounds like 
I mean, if you were to spread that across all sort of salary bands, it's about 10,000 cuts, I think, but it could be more than that because they're, they're saying staff in call centres and the distribution network are going to be mainly affected. And, and they can kind of push this as a, as in a way as an answer to, to COVID-19, I think, because you've got all these concerns about spreading the virus, you know, the idea of maintaining big call centres that people go into and sit around and drink coffee in doesn't seem like such a good idea. So all of a sudden, I think using tools like chatbots can be can be presented as a way to deal with that. Um, same goes for not having shops open, obviously, you know, companies want to make more use of their e-commerce channels so they can sort of justify not having staff in retail outlets. And he was also talking even about on the field side. So he, he didn't. He wasn't very specific about this, but he was saying you could use AI uh, and other technologies to cut down on truck rolls. You know, try and work out where network problems are occurring and not send technicians out. Um, Rakuten in Japan is is talking about some really wacky stuff in that area. They've got this plan to use drones even to send them out and inspect base stations, so they don't actually have to send uh, you know field engineers out anymore. I mean, that was not connected with COVID nineteen, but you can certainly see how something like that might be useful at a time like this. So I, I just think it's it's kind of more worry for telecom staff in 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 the US. And it'd be interesting to see what happens with Verizon today because they've been they've been really aggressive on the cost cutting front as well. And I think their results are out later. So I'll be sort of looking to see what they're doing at the moment. One one little tangent from what you're talking about um on that adjustments for for the lockdown thing. That was a major theme in the comments uh so just uh, yesterday, I think, um, the FCC, the U.S. telecoms operator, uh, officially agreed to free up a whole chunk of six gigahertz spectrum for unlicensed use, i.e. mainly used for Wi-Fi. And, and I went through the comments of all the um, commissioners, partly because I was looking. Normally what happens is they've got three commissioners that are affiliated to the, De the Republican Party and two that are affiliated to the Democrat Party, and they always disagree. And normally you get some really sort of stroppy, um performative stuff from the from the democrats but this time they all agreed with each other which i thought was interesting and a big narrative they're all saying is you know this this coronavirus stuff has shown how important it is that everyone's connected that you can do remote education that you can do remote this that and the other i've had a few times where i've been um speaking to uh sort of financial services providers where i'd normally expect to get through to a call center and my calls going through to someone's living room um, which has led to some sort of complications like calls getting cut off or bad quality. But it's a reminder that if with almost no notice, we can suddenly switch an office-based workforce to a remote workforce and it work. Imagine imagine if we actually put the effort in and you've got more dedicated services. You know, We've had Zoom this week try and raise its security gain because it was getting a lot of grief over that. So if Zoom improves, you get new things coming over, you get robust business-grade stuff you know there could be so much more remote working going on because it could be that they realize a lot of jobs are like our job you know we've, we've as journalists we've always been able to remotely work because you can tell whether we're doing any work or not because as to whether there's any stories that go up on the site so there's no need for us to be micromanaged and you know and jamie and i sort of communicate on, on a fairly minimal way over the course of the day just to just to just to make sure we're not covering the same story that's about it the rest of the time we're just cracking on I'm well, sure it's I think, you. Um, yeah, I, I, I could I think you're right. More industries. Go on, sorry. I was just going to say, I think that's one thing that's not going to, you know, talk about things happening now that, that stay with us after this pandemic passes. I think you're totally right. That's one thing that's not, maybe not going to come back. I mean, I'm not saying people don't go back to offices, they will, but I think there'll be a big shift in people who, you know, have gone through this experience and have found they can work at home and their employers have found they're just as productive. And it just stays and, it, and then it becomes uh, sort of in the interest of the employer as well then because everybody's going to be looking for cost savings everybody's going to be looking at ways to minimize office expenses and this kind of thing or maybe not even have to maintain a big call center in the future and, and do it through a mixture of, of chatbots and people working from their own homes so you know it, it could happen it didn't happen because of a cult of, of cultural reasons and now all of a sudden it's kind of been forced on us by the pandemic and it and it's probably going to be with us for, for forever i think and you can see other little uh, economic shifts like more people moving into the gig economy but not being uber drivers or whatever but you know let's say working mums who can say i will definitely be able to to be on hand for this call center between sort of 10 and 2 in the middle of the day when my kids are at school or something like that um you know it 
as, as we always talk about, when, they, when there's upheaval and there's automation and people lose jobs, it does create opportunities for, for new jobs. Granted, they're probably going to be on the more menial side. But, you know, like another example I was chatting to, I think I, I think I was chatting to my son about this when we were going for a walk. That's the other thing we've done. I don't know about you guys. I'm going for some nice long walks while we're able to be at home the whole time. Uh, still doing my work, though, anyone from Informa who's listening. Um, is uh, we're talking about TV programs and some TV programs, like I think Walking Dead, they they've had to delay the final episode of it because although they filmed it, they can't do the post production. Um, and so it could be that this will go up the up the stack a little bit, and you're going to get more highly skilled people doing stuff remotely if they got the bandwidth, such as you know collaborative creative stuff or or, or you know CGI or whatever. You know if the bandwidth is there. Um, then you don't need to all be on the same Ethernet network or whatever, and, and you can all collaborate remotely. So yeah, I think I think all that stuff's going to be really interesting. Um, right, I'm going to move it on, and we're going to talk about India, and we're going to start specifically with a story Jamie covered. Don't know if you did too, Ian, um, about Facebook buying ten percent of Reliance Geo, which is which is quite disruptive in a lot of ways so over to you jamie yeah i mean it's effectively it's um i don't know i can't remember exactly what the conversion was but it was about 5.7 billion um for facebook to buy a 9.99 percent uh stake in what they've called so it's, it's effectively reliance geo but they've called it geo platforms um so effectively, this is just an internal, um, we're calling it this because it's more than just a telecoms uh, company now. So the fact, so they bought into sort of like the, 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 the big data, the IoT, like the, the healthcare initiatives that they're, all, that they're running. So it's just a, it's an internal nuance, but it's the, 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 the TMT uh, business unit of Reliance Industries. Um, and, it, and for me, it's just um, there's aside from jump, you know, back in a winning horse in a market, which is which is um, yeah, potentially very, very profitable for a lot of people. And uh, this this ties into the this huge overarching um, sort of uh, Facebook strategy of connecting the next billion. Um, like I had a I had a look at it, the uh, looked at their financials over the last couple of years. And when you actually look at the amount of money that Facebook gets through traditional advertising or its core advertising products, and also compare it to the money which it's getting through other bets, there's still something like 98% of all revenues are through the advertising product. So if you're going to grow um, in the same manner that Facebook investors become really used to over the last couple of years, you need more people on the platform. And the only way to get more people on the platform, because most Western and de developed markets are now saturated, is to take connectivity to new markets. So supercharging Reliance Geo, um, allowing them to, giving them more cash to throw at network deployment, that works. Telecom infrastructure product uh, project tip, you know, commoditize hardware and di and dis um, disaggregate hardware and software. Great way for money to reduce deploy uh, deployment costs. Um, Libra means that anyone can engage in the uh, digital economy without having access to traditional finance and tra traditional banking infrastructure. And then the final one is, Ian will have to tell me what this is because I can never remember the name of the telco. They own X amount of a... Peruvian telco, which is using open RAN technology to deploy uh, networks in the rural communities in Peru. So it all ties together to this. If we want to make more money, we need eyeballs, uh, more eyeballs on the platform. And if we want more eyeballs on the platform, we need networks to go to places that networks aren't going to currently. And those four initiatives are perfect examples of how Facebook is pumping money in to get more advertising revenue. Cool, yeah, um, and and just the amount it can invest, as you say, these sort of billions of dollars, it's it's got uh, it's got incredible power to sort of influence the the telecoms market. And we've been writing about this with Facebook for a while since 
you know, the telecom infra project and and these there were specific little things I remember writing about three years ago. Oh God, I can't even remember the name of them, but there's a there's a remote connectivity one, there's an ultra high bandwidth one. And yeah, they've been they've been more innovative than you might intuitively have expected them to be. Uh, so that is interesting. The, the, the big problem also the, the one thing I wasn't right there, the big problem is is that they are pigeonholing themselves. Like if you actually look at their business model, and don't get me wrong, as long as it carries on making money, no one's gonna complain. Um, it is all advertising. Whereas you look at you know um, Apple or Facebook or um, Amazon, they're breaking out of their traditional revenue streams and they're adding new areas to bolster um, the, 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 to, to diversify revenues. Like let's just take Amazon, for example. It traditionally made money through delivering um, products to your doorstep in an online ecosystem. Now it has a now it, it's streaming um, uh, television content through Prime. Um, it's bought Twitch, so it's bought itself into the e-gaming um, uh, uh, segment. It owns the most successful cloud computing business around. Um, it owns Alexa, so it's starting to bridge its way into the home, um, the connected home ecosystem. Facebook hasn't done that. If you look at what it's done over the last couple of years, it's bought Oculus, um, which really hasn't gotten off the ground. Um, Portal, it's developed, but that really hasn't broken into the, um, the, the smart home segment. Uh, what else has it got? It's got works, Workplace by Facebook, their, their competition to Slack and Microsoft Teams and but that ne never really got off the ground. Um, and there's just so many. All it, It's placing all its eggs in a single basket, which is online um, advertising. And I, it'll carry on making money, but eventually it'll hit a glass ceiling, and it needs to diversify. And at the moment, it's failing to. Still yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I, I've been, I was just sort of searching through other stuff we'd written about Facebook. And what, one problem with this interface is you click back on it, but then you have to click the screen again to undo the mute. So I have to have Google sort it out. Um, uh, yes. Um, and just uh, going off on a bit of an Indian tangent. Um, so you rightly say, Jamie, that Facebook's sort of investing in the apparent winner of the Indian. Tele, uh, sort of mobile market, which is kind of alarming in itself that there should be one. I mean, we don't want a winner of a telecoms market. No one wants that. Um, but you know, everything we've been we've been looking at um, regarding geo for a while points to, towards them being the winner. And you know, there've been some more sort of not very promising signs for, especially Vodafone Idea this year. So we're basically left with three main players: geo. Party Airtel and Vodafone Idea, which is a product of of a uh, market consolidation not too long ago, and uh, Vodafone itself has decided to flog um, a big chunk of shares in um, Inwit, which is an Italian towers joint venture with Telecom Italia, uh, to raise about two hundred million euros. And at the same time, it didn't explicitly say this was the reason it was doing it, but at the same time. Um, it's gone and chucked a bunch of money at Vodafone Idea to sort of help it with cash flow and all that sort of thing. Um, and that's pointed to, I, I saw one bit which I've um, just fired up, Nikkei Asian Review. They've got a headline that says, Vodafone's India venture faces collapse despite cash injections. They talked about this cash injection, but said that that might not be enough. And then they put up a table which says, comparison between Vodafone Idea and Barty Airtel. So they're supposed to be the two strugglers behind this upstart um, uh, Reliance Geo, but actually their fortunes are going quite different directions. So they have a similar number of subscribers, just over 300 million. But according to this table, Barty Airtel revenue is over 800 um, billion rupees, while Vodafone ID was only 370, so less than half the revenue on a single similar number of subscribers, which crudely implies half the ARPU, which is kind of bizarre. And they, is a fraction. It's like a, a, a sixth of it. Net income, you know, Vodafone ID is losing billions, whereas Barty Airtel's just still in profit. 
So there's there's really contrasting fortunes there. And Vodafone Idea seems um, very much to be on the back foot there. Are they just being really lazy though? Um, the, the 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 new source. It because, could be. It's quite a simplified table. Yeah, because because obviously Barty Barty Airtel owns some massive massive ventures elsewhere in the world. So. I, d I don't know whether the, the journalist is just being really lazy and just counting group revenues. Because I know Party Airtel, for instance, has quite a successful African business um, where they make quite a lot of money. And obviously, they, uh, they, they make a hell of a lot of profit from Singtel as well. I think it is Singtel that they own. Um, it's one of, the, one of the other sort of Southeast Asian major telcos they have a, a huge stake in. Um, so I, I I wonder whether it's them being lazy because I would have thought, and going by all the evidence that the Indian business unit is completely ruined by Reliance Geo. Yeah, the, I, just chipping in, the, they might have they might have, uh, as you say, included a lot of African stuff. It sounds like to me, but I know I know Vodafone Idea hasn't been doing a particularly good job on the. On the on the whole, I mean, they've kind of cocked up a bit, really, on this merger. It's not really gone very well, I don't think. You know, and maybe this is probably something that's hurt them. Is they've not they've not been able to deal with that. Um, so, you know, reasons for this merger were to kind of become a, a stronger player and, and deal with that Reliance Geo threat. And it's just kind of been baggage for them, really, since it happened. It's never been something they've been able to get on top of. I think with this, um, you know, getting back to the Facebook move. It's a bit worrying for those two companies now, you know, Barty Airtel and, and um, Vodafone Idea, that, that Facebook's done this because one of the things Reliance G has always talked about doing is trying to have a a play in all sort of all the sort of digital aspects of, of Indians' lives, you know, and, and now they've got this kind of big social networking company coming along and taking a significant stake and, and teaming up with it to some extent. And how do they respond to that? You know, they're not really in a position to be able to do that at the moment. And um I don't know. It's it's worrying seeing where India might go at the moment with with you know the, with this COVID nineteen crisis on. It's not going to make things any easier for the companies that are struggling there. That Vodafone idea was already talking about having to exit the market, and there's going to be you know much bigger concerns now. I think that 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 country does end up as a duopoly in the in the near term, perhaps, and you know maybe you're even heading towards a monopoly in the future. I don't know, but it's it's. it's Stunning, really, to think it had so many players a few years ago, and you've now got the situation that, you, that it's in at the moment with three big players, two of them, and two of them, one in particular, struggling really badly. I mean, the interesting thing is, I, I was having a look at the numbers the other day. One other telco did grow over the final three months of um, uh, 2019, um, and this just shows how, how ridiculous the numbers are when you're talking about India. They grew their market share by, by something like 0.4 percent, which actually, in real terms, was something like four million subscribers that were added year on year. Um, but it was BSNL, um, so the government-owned telco, which has been declining for the three months uh, end in 2019. They actually grew their uh, their their subscriber base. No, still, they only have like 10% market share. But it, it is, I mean, perhaps if the Indian government want to pump some cash into that, maybe they could, that could, that could potentially do some damage and, you know, carve out some decent market share. Because at the moment, I think you're right, either heading towards duopoly or monopoly very, very fast. I can't see, I can't see Vodafone India turning around and, and lasting too much longer. I think they're going to ditch it before too long. I'll tell you one, one more thing to think about in the context of the, the geopolitical agro we were referring to earlier. Um, I, you know, if, if, if this does descend into more of a sort of formal Cold War, most people reckon it's not, not of the more belligerent nature that we had with um, NATO versus USSR in, in the second half of the 20th century. It's more economic and trade and all that sort of thing, um, and and framed largely by the the Chinese uh, Belt and Road strategy of if you're being unkind, you could call economic imperialism, i.e., chucking its money around uh, to buy influence. 
Now, it strikes me that India could be a real, um, could really be at the centre of that, because I don't think they're overtly um, allied in favour of either the West or China. Obviously, we got the historical connection with the with England, but that has many nuances and complications attached to it anyway, as we're a colonial power. Um, and so back to sort of Vodafone idea. Hello, Ian's going walkabouts. That's normally Jamie. You're going for a vape out the window, Ian. <laughs> um, now my neighbours have put music on really loudly, and it's coming through. The, what you might be able to hear it now. Is there a thudding sound? Swine. Yeah, well, so I just, well, I just had to close the window, but yeah. Okay, well, well done for adjusting. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, so one thing that could happen, maybe China uh, or some Chinese investment vehicle goes, look, Vodafone ID, you seem to be having a bit of a mare have this enormous pile of cash and then they suddenly buy a massive presence in the Indian market, which could, and it could be interesting to see how the Indians respond to that. Anyway, I'm just thinking out loud, but, but you know, this, this whole concept of financially distressed assets being snapped up by China, which, which as Ian, you said at the start, Europe seems to be worried about could just as easily apply to things like Vodafone idea in India. Okay. Let's move it on to the last item which again is something you wrote about recently, Jamie, uh, which is uh, Dish, uh, which is um, the, a fourth um, mobile network operator coming up in the States um, to some extent in the shadow of this T-Mobile Sprint merger that's completed. Uh, and they're very interesting. It's a bit like Rakuten in Japan. They're a sort of greenfield operator. So that means that they're in a position to innovate a bit more radically than other people. So over to you, Jamie, tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so I mean, um, obviously on the on the recruiting side, I think Ian would be best to, to, to comment on it, but I think it's a, what DISH is, is um, a, an excellent opportunity to build a network like recruiting has done, build a network as you perfectly imagine it. Uh, like for instance, I mean, I, I described it as a, a dream come true for any uh, any telco engineer, you you get to build a, uh, a communications network without being inhibited by um, uh, legacy technologies and systems, without having to make any concessions or trade-offs. Uh, you can build it exactly as you want to. Um, while this is a massive, massive uh, opportunity for uh, Dish, I mean, you, you, we've all seen that um, recruiting of put in some really, really, really low data tariffs to challenge the Japanese market. It is an immensely, it's a huge, huge task. Um, you know, you talk about the US, and this is something that Gabriel Brown, one of our colleagues over at Heavy Reading, was, was telling me about. Um, it's a, starting from scratch is brilliant because you've got nothing to inhibit you. But starting from scratch is a curse because you've got nothing to build on top of. You know, you literally have to start from nothing. And the US is, you know, it's a it's a it's a massive, massive market. It's almost four thousand percent larger than the UK. That's a good stat from where I where picked up this week. Um, but it only has um, five times the population. It's incredibly diverse. And then the other really, really difficult thing that uh, Dish has to imagine is that uh, the negotiate. Sorry is 50 different bureaucratic setups. You know, it's not like the UK where you have, you know, a, a centralised um, policy which feeds down and there might be nuances in all the different regions and local authorities. This is effectively 50 different countries, 50 different state-led um, bureaucracies and legislation that are all incredibly different. It's a monumental task to do, to build an entire network from scratch within seven years. Otherwise, um, their MVNO agreements with, um, uh, with T-Mobile concludes, and I imagine they're probably going to get screwed through the nose in terms of pricing. Um, you know, how are they going to do that? I've got no idea. Um, it's, it's monumental. It's a huge task. And... Um the uh, the specific story you wrote about Jamie was they're having a little look. Oh, and maybe, yeah, this is so directly they, relevant to what you're saying. Carry on, go. On. 
Yeah, yeah. So starting from scratch, you can build. They're they're building the 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 open RAN network, which will enable them. And Ian can go into the specifics on this now. To you know the the, the deployments. No, no. I'm talking about from recruiting perspective. Um, the the deployment costs are what reduced by twenty five percent. The operational costs are slashed. Um, you know, it's the advantage of having a having running a network out of a data center rather than as, as opposed to having to go out to the physical locations, which when you consider the size of the US and the, 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 the sparse population in some areas is a significant advantage. Um, but I mean, I, I, I don't know if you've been having a look at it. Ian, I've been having a chat with, with Mike over the US about it as well. So, so there's some interesting elements to dish. Yeah, I, I haven't looked at it as much as I should have done. I mean, I'm usually I'm usually kind of below the open round stuff and, and Mavenir got in touch with me when they had the announcement, but it, Mike ended up picking it up and I've, I've not really looked at his coverage because I've just been doing other things. But I mean, it's, as you say, on to watch because it's just, uh, um, as it's, it's a massive country, it's a massive project. It's, uh, you know, it's a major kind of publicity thing for open round and, and, you know, software-based networks and all this kind of stuff that we've been talking about, like reading the last few years. So everybody's going to be interested in seeing what happens there. And yeah, I mean, they, they recently launched, so they, they had their, their 4G launch on the 8th of April this month. Uh, now a couple of weeks of, the, of, of services being offered. I mean, I'm, I'm still kind of, I need, to, I need to get in touch with them really and say, you know, have you got anything to say about what's going on at first? Because everybody's, everybody's fascinated by that project. Everybody wants to know if that's going to work out. And it's a kind of proof point for this technology. So, Jamie says, "What one of the big challenges for Dish is? It's a huge country. You've got all this bureaucracy to deal with. You've got a massive area to cover, and they're trying to do this with technologies that are largely unproven. You know, that Rakuten's really the kind of first greenfield case of, of an operator doing open RAN in a really developed market and trying to disrupt the established order there. So everybody's kind of everybody's looking to see what the results are um but dish's dish's task is is monumental to do it in a market that's so much bigger with all the challenges they face um and and obviously things aren't things aren't great at the moment for getting it off the ground with with what's going on in the world economy i mean i think i think another uh, one of the more interesting points is because uh, i've just pulled up the the stats which i i have here i think if it does work it could really turn the us market on top, on its head because I think um, Rakuten's 5G offer is effectively 50% of anything else that's on the market. Now, if you actually look at the average revenue per user in, in, in all the individual markets around the world, um, like so all of these are US dollars and taken from Omdia's um, uh, data sets. The UK are paying on average $16 uh, a month for a connectivity product. In Italy, it's eleven dollars fifty-five. In the Netherlands, it's thirteen dollars forty-eight, and in Australia, it's twenty-two dollars sixty-five. Now, in the US, it's thirty dollars and eighty-five pen, uh, eighty-five cents. So that is almost double what we're paying here. Now, I know the US is expensive, and we've gone through all the reasons as to why it's expensive. But if you can relay the cost savings onto the consumer, like Rakuten is doing in Japan, this could drastic. This could be a, such a, a monumental disruption to an expensive market. You know, they could they could take it down to twenty dollars, and all of a sudden they're potentially still making money, and but they're offering a massive challenge to the other three more established players. There, I think it, it's if it works, it could be fascinating fascinating development in terms of price disruptive pricing models in the us i i've just realized something i um i bought a new mic uh for doing podcasts with and i've just realized it's got a mute button on it so i should just be using that instead of dicking about with the in, with the user interface on the screen so uh yeah I'll, I'll try that from now on you can tell me if it, if it lets any background noise or or disturbance through um while, while we're mentioning that that sort of mavenir gig uh with dish should also mention uh going back to our previous segment that they they also got a similar win with uh vodafone idea so it's good to see vodafone idea still trying stuff out and and in trying to innovate and and all that sort of thing um whether or not that will save the day is another matter 
Um, so yeah, so we're, we're more or less out of time. One thing I wanted to do just sort of ad hoc. Yeah, we haven't spoken about it because we spoke about it in the last pod or two. But on uh, on telecoms.com, the most read stories have still been to do with 5G conspiracy theories, which I don't know about you guys, but I'm finding them enormously entertaining. Uh, I'm also enjoying messing with commenters on, on the stories and trolling them because, of course, it gets, you know, there's a certain kind of fanatic that will comment on our stories over these things that wouldn't normally bother. You know, you're not going to get them commenting on a story about sort of network virtualization or something like that. But as soon as you start telling them that the government's trying to control everyone's thoughts through 5G, they come out and they, they've all got to have their stay on, on the uh, on the comments section. So that's all good fun. Jamie did an excellent one where you, where you had a little look at a bunch of different theories and debunked them. I've, I've written a couple of them. And I think just recently, Ian, I was looking on light reading, you did one. So I thought I thought we'd uh, I thought we'd sign off. I'll start with you, Jamie. Can you think? I know I'm just putting you on the spot without any preparation. Do you have a favourite five G conspiracy theory that you've covered? I mean the the uh, the one that sort of like stuck out in my head is that that um, and it's taken from a, a a largely disproven and discredited paper from two thousand and one uh, to do with uh, bacteria communicating using electromagnetic pulses throughout the body um, that you know that that these viruses COVID-19 can communicate with other infected hosts using um, the, the 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 5G airwaves I mean it's just it just beggars belief that some of these idiots believe it um, I I I, you just don't even. There's no way to argue with them, because because as part of the story um, that I wrote, I, I found this thing called the conspiracy theory handbook, and it goes through and it gives you all the stages how you can identify a conspiracy theory, but also what you can do to combat and to uh, to convince a conspiracy theorist that it's wrong. And I just don't fully understand how you can combat. The, the two ways to do it is basically through logic by by employing logic and employing facts, and with something as ludicrous as viruses are used in the five G airwaves to communicate with each other to figure out who to infect next. I don't even know where to start to try and debunk that theory because there's no. It's so detached from logic and fact that you can't even combat it with logic and fact. I mean, I just don't even know where to begin with that one. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I had a look at that one as well. I thought that was brilliant. And that's before you even get into the fact that this one paper, that its own researchers, they said at the end of it, a lot more needs to be looked into this, and then they never bothered. So they can't have been that interested. But even then, it was about bacteria. So you're dealing yeah. with people who don't even know the difference between viruses and bacteria. What can you you're do? Dealing with, you're dealing with a different type of, of, of molecular build. It's not even an organism. I mean, bacteria are organisms and viruses aren't unnecessary organisms. So it's it, it's so, I mean, it, you can't even, there's no way to debunk it with logic because it's just so batshit illogical. I just don't even know where you begin with it. Well, quite. What, what about you, Ian? Have, have you got any favourites? I don't know if I've got a favourites. I mean, I, I agree on that point, though. I think this whole thing is, is you know, one of the issues, I think you wrote about this as well, Scott, but one of the issues you have with this is there seems to be this, uh, certainly in the mainstream media, this effort to try and debunk this uh, this theory. I, you, you go onto the BBC and they've got reams of paragraphs explaining why it doesn't cause a uh, virus. And I noticed that I tried to put out a sort of, uh, tried to do a similar thing. You know, this is, this is the reason it doesn't. And there's nothing to say. It's just so stupid. It's like it's like trying to explain why Gorgonzola doesn't cause earthquakes or something. You know, it's just it's just where where does anybody possibly get the connection from? And the only thing I can think is that you know it's something to do with the, the more rational concern, I guess, that there's a, there's a kind of cancer um, causing uh, you know effect with with radiation. Um, you can see you can kind of see where that concern comes from. How, how it ever ended up being a, a sort of, you know, that this equipment can spread viruses as well, I don't know. But the, the trouble with getting scientists to try and explain this is that they end up throwing this 
Ofcom put this statement out that went on and on about coronavirus and then all of a sudden there's this massive non secretaire and they start they jump and start talking about radiation and the fact that it doesn't cause cancer it's like that the scientists are trying to explain something but there's no there's no sensible explanation to provide so they end up jumping to, to other other stuff about health and and then it and then it becomes even more confusing so um it's, it's just it's just insane i mean this is this is a time for nonsense conspiracy theories though isn't it we've got injecting yourself with disinfectant now is the latest cure for uh covid19 so it's just at times like this the nut jobs come out of the woodwork don't they well i i, I was quite encouraged when they talked about hydroxychloroquine because i know that's a quinine and there's also quinine in tonic water so i thought well that's that's my cure but a few g and t's and i'm sorted but I, I think I found out that the however much quinine there is in tonic water is, is not going to get the job done. I mean, but you're you're completely right what both of you said. The problem is where to start. When I when I've been researching this stuff, there isn't much material explaining how organic particles can't be transmitted over electromagnetic waves. Because as you say, Ian, it's like there's not much material explaining why cheese doesn't cause earthquakes. It's just such a given that no one's bothered to write it up. So where do you start? Oh, there's, I've, got to, I've got to point to uh, one little sparring thing I've had with a commenter called Des Morris on, on, on a story I wrote. He did this massive thing saying, viruses are damaged cells, which they're not. This, that, and the other, which isn't true. Uh, this radiation, which isn't true. And so I just responded and said, everything you said was wrong. And then he responded back going, how can you say that when I've quoted facts and then reeled off a bunch of other facts, none of which were facts. So I just said, all your facts are wrong. But I mean, I could, you know, I could do this all day, couldn't I? Uh, he's, he's not going to listen to me. He, he's totally invested in, in this thing. Um, but that's why, you know, it might seem it might seem excessively flippant and disrespectful for me to just say he's wrong. But I just don't see the point in investing any more time and debunking each thing. You know, the, to say that viruses are particles of damaged cells is just inherently wrong in itself. So as, when that's his opening statement, where do I go from there? There is a bad side to all of this as well. There's, there's, a, there's a serious side to this, which is, and I think uh, the BBC was reporting on this uh, late yesterday, that, you know, we've got the arson attacks happening on, on Mars. You know, we're now there's now reports of, of engineers actually trying to do work and, having their trucks vandalized or even being through I think there was one engineer um quoted in, on the BBC website saying he got threatened with with either being stabbed or shot uh and you know on, on top of other things that we see happening to kind of key workers you know nurses getting abuse and reports of supermarket staff getting abuse it's it's all it's all pretty horrible really that that there, that there are these characters around so that that's the it's it's ridiculous and it's kind of funny in a way, but we don't want we don't want this side of it happening because it's it's not good for the people doing those jobs, obviously, and it's not good for the broader economy that depends on telecoms equipment more than ever at the moment. Yeah, I think we can all agree with that. I think I think the report you were talking about, a, a communications union, had said that there's been a real spike in agro. I mean, I'm not I'm not going to go off on this tangent now, partly because I I've laboured it many times in the past, but I think we all more or less agree that the answer to this is attempts at education rather than censorship. I've written a couple of stories. Facebook's trying to censor this stuff. Twitter's trying to censor it. But I just, you know, apart from the fact that I personally feel quite strongly hostile to censorship anyway, as I think all journalists should, although not all do, um, I also just think it doesn't work. Um, not only do you drive it underground, but, you know, if you've got a real nut job and you censor them, then you're just confirming the conspiracy, aren't you? So yeah, education just just help people understand. Teach them about the electromagnetic spectrum. Teach them that that organic particles or, or any physical particles at all can't be transmitted over electromagnetic radiation. But some nutters are going to not believe you and go around sharing this stuff. What can you do? Cool. All right then. Um, I think we'll call it a day there. So uh, thanks again, lads, and thanks everyone for listening. Try not to follow too many crazy theories until we're able to re-educate you again next week. Join us for that one. Cheers. Cool. Right. The one...